You're listening to a message from New Beginnings Lakeside Church. Today's speaker is Pastor Doug Horner. We are segueing now from Matthew 24 to 25, and in the middle uh, of that segue, before we get into 25 next Sunday, uh, I, I promised last Sunday that we would talk about the rapture and why I believe uh, that it's a pre-trib, pre-tribulation event and where I see the scriptures in that. So I don't know, I'm, you know, I'm a child of the 60s and 70s, 80s, and I remember the bumper stickers. I don't see them much anymore, but do you remember, those of you who are the, the child of that age, that said, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned? You guys remember that? I don't see them too often anymore. I don't think people think about it as much as, uh, as they, they used to. Uh, but I will say in the last couple hundred years, we've become more intensive in our study of end of time things. It's kind of been from you know, generation to generation, different things that we've emphasized uh, within the study of the church. And one of those studies here in the last couple hundred years has been the rapture. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's exciting to think about the rapture. Uh, when we were kids in the youth group I went to, we used to do rapture practice. You remember? You would just jump up, you know? You just get yourself ready to jump up, you know? Anybody do that? Uh, I saw movies from the 70s, A Thief in the Night and A Distant Thunder. Back in those days, it wasn't VCRs. Um, it, was, uh, it was actual film, film, film reels. And I remember Pastor David Easter getting, getting a film reel in and trying to hook up, that up to the projector uh, that we had at the church, and you threw it up onto the wall. It had the worst uh, audio that, you know, and it had that like blur, 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 blur sound as it was trying to go through, but it scared you to death. You know, everyone, even if you were already saved, you got saved again before you left youth group that night. That's how, that's, that's what you think, that's when you think of, of the end of to, end times, you get scared. And, and it was another thing, as I don't know if you're like me, but during times of crisis or stress or, or finals, you're like, Lord, if you came back tonight, I wouldn't have to study for this exam. I could, I could, I could you know, this exam could pass from me and I could go into attorney. How many of you really truly prayed for the rapture to come during a final? Yes. Yes, so the last days, it's something we should think about. And the church, uh, the coming, you know, the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ, which are two different events, should motivate us to live out and proclaim the gospel message to a world, to a lost and dying world. Uh, In mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said, if you read history... You will find that the Christians who did most for the present world uh, were just those who thought most of the next world. The apostles themselves who set on foot the the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. So that's an encouragement to us, an encouragement. And Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 11, every Sunday we take communion. I was visiting with some families this week, Jennifer and I had the opportunity, had a really wonderful week of visitations with people, and one of the questions was about how often we do communion and why, and, and not that there's any, you know, thing that says you have to do it every week. I love doing it every week. I grew up in the world uh, back in West Virginia. We did it quarterly, and I love doing it every week. It's a reminder to us. It's a reminder to us. Here's what Paul wrote in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. Begin at verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, 
which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me in the same way. Also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And there's the key verse, verse 26. We, we, I think we were all attuned with, with this body that was broken for us, for his blood, you know, the cup that represents the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Every Sunday that we take communion, and I, I love that, that about this body, is, is you take it so seriously. And people pop corn up during the last part of the last song at different times because everyone's having a deep prayer, a deep time of conversation with God. And we're remembering, thanking God for salvation through Christ, through all that he went through on our behalf. It's a constant reminder of what we are and who we are in Christ because of what the work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection. But here is something we overlook. Verse 26 says, For often as, you, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul is reminding us not just to look back and be thankful for what God has done for us through Christ, but also to look forward to his coming. We are to look forward to his coming. It reminds us to to look forward as we eat and drink uh, every week or every time that we partake so that we proclaim his death, his resurrection, his salvation until he comes. So we're going to look today at the rapture. We don't find the actual word rapture in the Bible, but we do find the doctrine of the rapture all over the Bible. And for you students of the word, you don't find the word trinity in the Bible, but the doctrine of the Trinity is everywhere. So the teaching of the rapture, the catching away of the church is clearly taught, and it's from the Greek word harpazo. Uh, Jerome translated the word harpazo from Greek into Latin, and he used the Latin word raparea, and the other word rapto, for which we get our word rapture. And again, it's a different event from the second coming. As a matter of fact, Dr. David Jeremiah writes concerning the rapture and the second coming. It says this, at the rapture, Jesus will return for his saints. At the second coming, he will return with his saints. At the rapture, Jesus will not descend to earth. At the second coming, he will descend to the Mount of Olives as a prelude to his earthly reign. At the rapture, Jesus will bring blessing for his saints, and at the second coming, he will bring judgment for those who rejected him. So that understanding of the rapture event, harpazo, uh, it's, it's, that word specifically is stated or used uh, 13 times in the New Testament. And there are three basic variations or meanings of the word, and all of them uh, contribute to our understanding of the word rapture. The, word, the first one, harbatso, is to carry off by force. Now, that doesn't sound very exciting to be carried off by force, but it's not in the intention of that. Uh, the intention here is irresistible force. Think of the, the times you've been carried away in your life. I'm the ladies in the house, as well as the gentlemen who've got married. They've married, and, and, and you were, you know, at that moment. Now it's a, a massive, major film production when you have an engagement, and there's, you know, there's a film crew, and there's music probably. Uh, the, the world is around hiding. You know, I know Jess's parents, uh, when they were out in California, and David was getting engaged with Jer uh, Jess, uh, they, uh, they, were, they dressed up and. You know, uh, even uh, Jess's mom had a mustache on and a, a sombrero so that uh, Jess didn't see who she was. It was hilarious. It's a production. But here's the thing I want you to say. I want you to understand. That's a moment of irresistible force. The anticipation and excitement of such an event. And then the actual wedding day, you know, when, when the couple comes to marry one another. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a moment of irresistible force. It's a special time. 
Another meaning can be to snatch away speedily. And a third meaning to rescue from the danger of destructions. And this last definition suggests that the rapture will save the church from the seven-year tribulation. Now, here are some different tribulation or rapture uh, time frames. Um, we've been talking about this throughout the uh, last three, three or four weeks. Uh, but there's the pre-tribulation rapture position uh, that believes Christ followers are caught up before the final seven-year uh, tribulation period. There's the mid-trib uh, uh, rapture position that believes Christ's followers are caught up in the midst of this final seven-year event. Uh, there is the pre-wrath rapture position, which uh, is pretty new in, in my understanding, uh, where Christ's followers are caught up at some time in the second half of the seven-year period. And then there's the post-trib, uh, where they combine the second coming uh, with the rapture uh, when, when Christ comes. Uh, and this position believes followers are, his Christ followers are caught up at the end of this final seven-year period. And here's the reality. There's, there's scholarship in terms of study, scriptures. Um, everyone has their understanding, their belief, and their interpretations. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I don't believe we have, have to go through the tribulation as his church I see throughout the Old Testament, I see in the Passover with the blood over the door frames of the house that, that from the uh, rejecting heart of the people uh, of Egypt, that the, the people of God were saved from uh, the death angel that came. Lot uh, is another example of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was blotted out from this earth and uh, Lot was saved uh, uh, through uh, his faith uh, and his you know, relationship to God. I mean, we could go on through the generations. It's, I believe that the rapture is specific judgment on wickedness, the rejection of Israel um, from, from, for God and the Messiah during Jesus' time here on this earth. Uh, that's a part of it we're going to look at this morning, as well as the wickedness uh, of the world, the rejection of the world against, of God. Ultimately, God knows. And the best way that we can be ready, and we talked about this last Sunday, is to be saved. I had the opportunity, uh, Jennifer and I were at a home this week. Uh, with a couple young ladies who prayed to receive Christ. Uh, there's been, uh, and I don't know for whatever reason, we've had like probably five or six baptisms this summer. It's, it's unreal, the, the hearts that God is transforming, the fruit that God is bearing uh, in his ministry, and so thankful that we get to ride that wave. Uh, there'll be a baptism, like I said, like they said today, um, and then there's a baptism coming up on the 30th. Uh, there'll be baptism at our annual uh, anniversary uh, celebration. I mean, God is so rich in, in his work and the lives of people. But I say that to say God is on the move and people are making decisions for Christ. And that's the best way you can prepare, you know, be, in, be prepared for the coming of Christ. Not to wait not to think we got all the time in the world. I'll do it when. I'll do it then. I'll do it this. You know, I'll do it that. You know, I'm going to do this for a while. And when I'm done doing that, I'll get serious about God. No, what Jesus is saying is that we should be serious about him now. So let's look at um, some of the passages from the word of God as to why I believe the pre-tribulation rapture position is biblically correct. And we'll start with the Old Testament. The number one is the Old Testament. And we have notes. Uh, there's extensive notes today. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But um, this has been uh, uh, over a month in preparation. As we look to the Old Testament, Daniel uh, is, is, is one of the keys, I think, to understanding. As a matter of fact, I was, I've been talking to my twin brother, my, Mike, who's a pastor in West Virginia. And uh, up until a few years ago, he held to a post-tribulation uh, rapture belief, but he has come to a pre-tribulation 
rapture understanding in his own life now. We've been having conversations for several weeks. And this is one of the areas that really struck a chord in him is the, the, the key of Daniel in the, in the scope of the end of time things. Uh, as you look especially to Daniel 9, Daniel 11, uh, 10, 11, and 12, and the end of time. So Daniel um, A would be the time of trouble destined for Israel. Understand that missing 70th week that both Pastor David and Pastor Billy and their teachings uh, several weeks ago talked about that missing 70th week. Daniel speaks to the reality of that that is to come for the tribulation. That seven-year period is the missing week. And that uh, particular you know, discourse on the 70, 70 weeks was connected to Israel personally. So one of the things that we'll, say, well, we'll, talk, we'll understand this morning is that you know, uh, disobedience and judgment is specific in the Old Testament when it comes to God and his people. And so that's a big issue here within Daniel is that that 70th week, that missing week, will be the conclusion of the judgment of God upon Israel. That 70th week, they, they had disobeyed. 490 years of disobedience about resting the land. And that was one of the issues that God uh, judged them on from the Old Testament, and this is a part of it, and that's why they were exiled uh, during the time of Daniel. Um, and this, this missing 70th week will, will be there to finish or complete that judgment. That's one part of the tribulation we understand. Daniel 12, 1 says, at that time shall arise Michael, uh, that is the archangel Michael, uh, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never been seen since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. So first off, I just want a, a side note. Michael the archangel shall stand up. He shall arise to defend the, the nation against who? Against um, Satan and, and, and the, the realms of evil during that time. And the angel Michael is often associated with spiritual battle in Daniel chapter 10 and Jude chapter 1 and Revelation 12. And here, here he is, the archangel, and he is Satan's true opposite. I, I want the church to hear that this morning. J Jesus and God are not the true opposite of Satan. He has no, he's not in that class. People always try to say that, you know, he's against God and all that. And he is, but God is not Satan's equal. Do you, do we understand that church? It's Michael, the archangel. He was a created being just like Lucifer. So he is Satan's true opposite. And so I just wanted to make that note. The other note I want to make is about Israel, Israel and, and a remnant because there at the end of 12.1, everyone whose name shall be found uh, in the book of life, they, uh, written in the book, they will be delivered. So Romans 11 uh, in verse 25 through 27 speaks to that. It says, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware, unaware of this mystery, brothers. And when he says brothers, he means brothers and sisters. It's, this is the, the church. I want, that's, that's what Paul is, under, is teaching here to the church. Uh, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so that's a picture of the church. They rejected, the, the, those in Israel rejected Jesus. They crucified him. I, I will not say that everyone uh, rejected Christ. Understand that there, were, there was a remnant in Israel that you know, has come to Christ throughout the generations, but this is what you know, Paul was speaking of here. And it gave room, it says, verse 26, in all, and in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will banish ungodliness from uh, Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So the whole question of Romans 11 is that Israel lose their place as God's chosen people, and the answer is no. 
The covenant with Abraham still stands. And there will be a remnant who will, uh, who, who has, there, there are, there have been, you know, a remnant who believed in the, the covenant and then the second covenant with Christ, the New Testament covenant. There are those, but also there will be a, a remnant that will come in. So, um, so here's what, here's kind of a little thought on the theme of Romans 11. God has given Israel the spirit of stupor. In other words, has blinded them at this time. Uh, there are those in Israel who, who have fallen. And as I was studying, and I mean, I've been all over the place, but as I was studying about the fallen is that when, you're, when you fall, you've fallen, you're down. But there are those who've stumbled. And, and, and if you've stumbled, some of you have stumbled in life, that, you know, walking, and you don't go down. And that's the picture here that Paul is painting. They may merely have stumbled, and they will become a remnant that God saves. Uh, they will believe in Jesus the Messiah. And in the meantime, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And I believe that's a picture of the church until the last person. Who's that going to be? You know, which, which, what, you know, when you get to heaven, are the angels are going to, which angels are going to say, you were the last one and you barely got in. Boy, I don't want to be that guy, you know, but I understand that is a picture, a time of trouble. Also, Israel be a special target of the Antichrist. Jeremiah 30 verse 7, alas, that day is so great, there's none like it. It is a time of great distress uh, for Jacob, yet, yet he shall be saved out of it. So uh, the Israel has been a target. Um, he also says there is a time, none like it. None like it. It's, and we've talked that over and over. This is the distress. This is the tribulation for Jacob. Again, these are the picture. This is the Old Testament picture of what the tribulation is going to be for the, the unbelieving Israel and, unbel and an unbelieving world. And so there's a time none like it. It is a time of distress for Jacob. Uh, the Jewish people have known many times of trouble through their history. The terrors wrought by Antiochus Epiphanes, the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, the persecution during the Dark Ages, the massacres of Europe, the 20th century Holocaust. It's many times of trouble. And what, uh, what the Jer Jeremiah, the prophets are saying, this time will be different. It will be worse than it has ever been. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, he gives us uh, a special address to the Jews that's the picture of 24 as he's talking to the disciples. He's talking to the Jews. He says, if you're living in Jerusalem, you see this happening. The Antichrist going in to rebuild the temple and desecrating it and calling himself God. Get out now. Get out now. Don't stop to get anything. Leave and flee to the, to the hills. This is the picture of those who would face the tribulation. But for, for us, for the church you know, the last thing of the Old Testament I want to look at this morning before we move on is, is D, is hidden until the fury has passed away. Isaiah 26, verses 20 and 21, it says, Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut uh, your doors behind you. Hide yourself for a little while until the fury has passed by. This is a picture to me of the, of the tribulation and how we are going to be uh, rescued from it. For behold, the Lord is coming from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. It's a judgment on the earth for the iniquity or the sins of the world, for, for the rejection of, of God through, um, in Israel. So for the believer, for those who have given their life to Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation. So that's the picture he will, we will cover, be covered by God. For it's the righteous anger of God, uh, God's people are hidden from uh, is from the Lord himself. And this is not a persecution from the wicked, but a judgment from the Lord. So we're, we're going to get to hide ourselves. And that's a picture. Why do I believe this passage uh, speaks to this? Well, verse 19 of that same passage refers to the dead Coming to life. That is a rapture verse. 
That is a rapture, uh, you know, as, as if it came from Paul himself. Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. The picture that Christ, that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are alive. We're going to look at that in the Apostle Paul. Let's look at that for a moment. Let's move to the Apostle Paul, who gives us many, many teachings on the rapture. For 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. This is a mystery made known to Paul. We shall not, not all sleep, uh, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we, and we shall be changed. So Paul talks about the transformation that takes place for all believers at the rapture. Verse 53 says, For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must, be put, must put on immortality. So the dead in Christ will raise bodily. They will raise bodily, resurrected, and meet him in the air. That's, that's one of the aspects that Paul speaks about is that the dead in Christ, those who've died before us, people always ask the question, you know, do, do the, you know, the people who have died, do they miss uh, the rapture? No. Are they in some sort of state, you know, flotation state, you know, and, and, and stuff? No. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But then our body will be resurrection, resurrection will be brought back and re renewed, made new. And you know, what if, and what if in heaven baldness is perfection? Huh? <laughs> Some of us are already well on our way there. And I'm just telling you for hairdressers, I'm just telling you, your, your journey of hairdressing will not end here. Okay? Unless baldness, unless baldness is perfection. I don't know. Just saying that. Throwing that out there. But understand this. Paul expresses the same idea again in 1 Thessalonians 4. He says this, verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. They were concerned. The church at Thessalonica was concerned about, you know, what about those loved ones who have died and, and we, did they, do they miss the, the rapture? That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus God will bring with him all those who fall asleep. So let's go back to Isaiah 26 for a minute, just in, in our minds, and understand that the Old Testament understanding of resurrection was like non-existent. They had no real belief about resurrection. And here's Isaiah proclaiming the dead will rise. Here is Paul proclaiming that Jesus, because Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and the sound of the trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, so shall we be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So it's the coming of the Lord, that phrase is specific. It's a specific phrase for the rapture. And those who are alive be in this under, under Paul, the Apostle Paul, as those who are alive in Christ on earth will meet him in the air. So we'll, we'll become Superman for a little bit and be something else. I've always wanted to fly, you know. From the time I was a little kid, I used to jump off our stairs in the basement, like, come on, I want to fly. But I never, never made it. I, I flew for about two seconds. <laughs> Paul even references the return of Jesus in terms of a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, these are just for, I think they're in your notes. That I think I put these in your notes. It, um, but just want to want to share a couple thoughts on First Thessalonians one ten shows believers waiting for the return of Jesus. The clear implication is that they had a hope, they had a hope in his imminent return, not the expectation of an imminent great tribulation. They had a hope in his return for them. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 assures us that those believers who died would share equally with, uh, with the living and the events of the rapture and the resurrection, answering their fear that they would have missed it. But here's the thing I want us to understand is, is that Paul, um, if, if he believed that we would face tribulation, because you know he talks about comforting, then he would have counted the dead more blessed. He would have counted the dead more fortunate for having missed the tribulation and, and, and us to have to endure the great tribulation. So it's not that Paul says to comfort the, so, so, uh, the Thessal, uh, Thessalonians with his understanding that the dead and Jesus were better, you know, not better off. They, they were at the same level that we would all share in the same moment together, their bodies resurrected with them and us, you know, meeting Christ in the air. Second Thessalonians 1, 3 through 10 comforts Christians enduring hardships, promising them a coming rest while their persecutors will face certain judgment. And so if, if Paul thought that we would be here for the tribulation as his church, he would have tried to comfort or warn these Christians about worse trials and suffering ahead. So those are just some pictures. Another thing that Paul speaks of that sp speaks loudly to me is 2 Thessalonians 2, 5 through 7, and that is the restrainer is taken out of the way but not removed. And the restrainer here, let's look at this, verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And that's the picture of the Antichrist is already at work. The, that, that, that spirit of the Antichrist is already at work, but it's being restrained. Only he, he who now restrains it will do so and take it away. And I believe that the restrainer here is the Holy Spirit, and part of that is within the church. And when the church is raptured, when the church is taken out, that, that spirit is not taken out, of the, it's taken out of the way, but not fully removed. And that's, that's just, it's hard to comprehend. That's my understanding that the spirit, because during the tribulation, people will still be saved. And the work of the spirit to save, to seal, and to serve will still be alive and the, and the people who are giving their life to Christ during such a tragedy of a time. But the church is taken away, and I think that will be a great removal of, of you know, that will be a pulling away, a taking back of the, of the Spirit for the reason that God will judge, use that removal to judge, uh, the pulling back to judge a sinful world. The third thing I want us to look at is Jesus himself as he comforts his church. Jesus promised to come for his church in John 14, 1 through 3. And if we're looking at the Bible to, to uh, interpret the Bible, that's, that's, that's the best way to interpret the Bible is allow the Bible to interpret itself. Jesus tells us of his coming. Let, your not, your heart, uh, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, he's getting ready to go to the cross. And, you know, we're in those pages right now of, of the Holy Week, of this week that, you know, we're getting ready to move after we get through 25 into the, the passion of the Christ. Uh, so he's with the disciples in John uh, chapters 13 through 17. It's a very intimate uh, conversation and prayer um, and, and discussion about his going away. And again, so he's telling his disciples who were concerned. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, uh, uh, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. So I believe this, 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 is, this is a rapture verse and that Jesus said he was coming to take us back to, to heaven, to be with him where he is, we would be with him and, and, and talking about the places we would dwell. And so verse, uh, Luke chapter 21 teaches us we are to make ready to be saved. We are to make ready. We are to be ready. 
Uh, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life. That, remember, he was comparing in Matthew 24 uh, to the times of Noah. They were just going on about their life, doing what they wanted to do. And the day, and he says here, and the day come upon you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying uh, that you may have strength to escape all these things they, that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man, that we will stand in Christ if we are ready, if we are saved. And, and I believe that will be the escape, will be the rapture for the church. And then the, he says um, the reality of the world, that, that the fact that they will, they will be dealing uh, with, with the, the things that are to come. And then we have the faithful church at Philadelphia. It's hard to talk about the rapture and not see as he talks about the seven churches in Revelation uh, chapter, you know, the first, first three chapters uh, we, of, of Revelation. We, we get into the churches and, and really then there, there's a, there, the church disappears um, until he comes with Christ at the end. So Revelation 3.8 says to the church, uh, the faithful church at Philadelphia. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So there's a picture, you know, first, you know, all the churches heard, I, knew, I know your work, and then there would be some sort of chastisement towards them. But to the persecuted church and to the church here at Philadelphia, this is the faithful church. There is no indictment. But it's an encouragement. And remember, those, these, those churches existed. Uh, the letters were taken to those churches uh, after they were written. Uh, but they also represent the kind of churches we have today. And, and the, the faithful church, you know, the, the persecuted church is still very much alive. And, and the fact is, is the church has been under an assault of persecution from the day of his inception. As a matter of fact, the early church, the first church spread, spread to the world because of persecution out of Jerusalem. It, you know, left, you know, because of persecution that began to rain down. But he, God says, I, I know your works. I see, I've set before you uh, an open door. And that often, that open door speaks to an evangelistic opportunity that ch the church today, the faithful church of today, uh, like then, is reaching people for Christ, is evangelizing the world. Why? It goes back to making ready. Making ready for what, however you want to believe the end's going to come. It's all going to pan out as long as we're saved. As long as we're saved. So it's an evangelistic opportunity, and they must go through it, that evangelistic opportunity door, through the door of faith, to continue to be faithful to God. Revelation 3.10 then says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of tri trial that is coming on the whole world to try uh, those who dwell on the earth. Now, understand, again, there was a purpose for that letter for that church at that moment, and God would deliver them. We don't know, you know, we don't know much about the church of Philadelphia other than what you know, John is writing through the inspiration of God. But the picture here is that it also has an eternal understanding, that uh, a future understanding for you and I. And I believe that Jesus promised to protect them from the hour of the coming trial, uh, and that that hour of coming trial is the great tribulation, and that we would be, you know, uh, you know, raptured, you know, uh, for before, before. Why? Because it says here uh, in the passage is coming to the, uh, on the world to try those who dwell on the earth nine times. That phrase is nine times in the book of Revelation, and it speaks specifically to those who are not saved. Those people who dwell, who are, you know, who dwell on the earth, those are people who are not saved. They're not believers. That is what the test 
of those who dwell on the earth. That's what the test is coming for, for the, for the, the unbelieving uh, Jews and the uh, unrepentant, wicked world, those who dwell on the earth. And the, here's the last thing. We're going to land the plane with this. There's been a lot, uh, and I mean, I'm telling you, I can, can I just say, probably had close to 50 note pages of notes, and I got it down to 21, 21 today. Just to, get, just to give you some insights, and in no way is it all the things that we could talk about. There's so many things. But here's the last thing, and this one is big for me, is this. The church comes with Christ from heaven at the end. The church comes from, with Christ from heaven. Look at Revelation chapter 19. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was also granted, uh, it was granted for her, her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. So this is, you know, we're the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. It's a beautiful picture. Uh, we will have the marriage, you know, of the lamb. There'll be the marriage supper of the lamb. But verse nine says this, and the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lambs. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Who are invited? Who's invited? Those who have claimed the blood of Jesus Christ over their life for the forgiveness of their sins. You're invited if you've given your life to Christ. Those two little girls that are getting baptized on, you know, this, this, this morning after the service and, and who prayed to receive Christ, I assured them before I left Wednesday night, they are invited They've, they're saved. That was one, they wanted to make sure, are we saved? That was the, the littlest asked me, am I saved? Absolutely. Absolutely. And are you saved? If you're saved, if you've, if you've pleaded the blood of Jesus Christ over your life, then when the rapture comes, you will be taken, uh, I believe, before the time of tribulation. I believe that because in Revelation 19, verse 14, it says, And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And these are the people of God. These are the people of God. When Jesus comes, look at verse 11 of that same passage, 19, about Revelation 19. And then I saw heaven opened. And this is just right after the marriage supper of the Lamb or the marriage you know, uh, of uh, the, the, the bride being readied. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it was faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has the name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. Who are we talking about, people? Jesus. This is Jesus. And verse 14 says, And the armies of heaven <coughs> arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on what? Horses. These are the people of God. These are the people of God. We'll be coming with Christ in the moment of his second coming. He calls us in the rapture. He's not out of earth in the rapture. He's in the clouds. He calls to us. He calls his church to come. In the second coming, we will be with him. He will come to, 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 to make war in Armageddon. It will be a one-sided war. It won't last long. The, 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 you know, I read through many parts of that re realization and that, you know, the flesh of the kings and the, the, the people of the world, you know, that, that birds will, this is kind of disgusting, will gorge themselves on the flesh. But here's the reality. He will set up his earthly kingdom. He will first set first foot, you know, at, as he comes down and does the battle. His first setting of foot will be on a Mount of Olives. It will split and then he'll begin the, the, the steps of setting up his millennial kingdom. So I want us to go back for one moment to verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 11 as we come to the table this morning and we close. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Every time, every time 
we come to the table. We remember all that Christ has done. Thank God. Thank you, God, for salvation through Christ. Thank you, God, for the opportunities he sets before us to do ministry as his followers in this life. But also thank you, God, as we take this communion every Sunday, remember to look forward to his coming. Father, thank you for this just guiding us, and I just pray you'll bless and be upon this moment now as we come to your table. So remember each and every one of us individually. Maybe there's someone this morning, whether they're online or here in the service, that knows they need to, to get ready, to be ready, and that's to get saved. And so, Lord, if someone's here this morning, before we come to the table, and remember your body that was broken for us and your blood that shed for the forgiveness of our sins, Lord, I pray that they would receive Christ. Pray something like this, dear Lord, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who lived and gave his life for my sin. I ask him to come into my life. Forgive my sin. From this day forward, I choose to follow him. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege to be a part of such an amazing body of believers. Continue to guide us, Lord. Help us to be uh, all that you have called us to be. Uh, thank you for this time now, too, to come to your table. Help us remember all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.